Hi, welcome to the Following Films Podcast. Every week we explore the creative minds behind the arts. I'm Chris Maynard, your host, and today we have a special guest with us, Art Alexa Key from the band Everclear. We're going to discuss their latest album, Live at the Whiskey A Go-Go. But before we jump into the interview, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Bookman's. Bookman's is an independent bookstore that provides a vast range of options for books, movies, music, and more. They truly believe in the power of storytelling and the magic of the creative arts. So if you wish to enhance your music, film, or book collection, make sure to visit your nearest Bookman's, as there are always incredible discoveries to be made. Have you already followed the Following Films podcast on Spotify? If you have, well, thank you. If you hadn't, head on over to Spotify, search for Following Films, click that follow button. It would mean a lot to us and help grow the show. And as a bonus, we have a giveaway for the new Christopher Nolan film, Oppenheimer. Two lucky winners will receive digital codes from Universal Pictures. To join the contest, all you have to do is follow the Following Films podcast on Spotify, take a screenshot, and send it to chris at followingfilms.com. So don't miss a chance and follow us on the show. You can also support the show by becoming a paid subscriber at podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash following films slash support. Easiest link ever. If you didn't get that for some reason, it's in the show notes. Live at the Whiskey A Go-Go is available wherever you buy or stream music. Hope you enjoy the show. Thanks. Do you, do, do you go by Christopher or Chris? I, either way is fine. I think Chris is what most people call me. So okay. uh, when you have the last name Maynard, you end up with a lot of people that call you Maynard also. So I'm, Maynard. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm pretty uh, comfortable with whatever. I'm not too picky on it, honestly. Okay. Very cool. Uh, but um, thank you for taking time to do this, man. Um, I, I was honestly, I was really happy last week when you canceled due to a family thing. You had something going yeah. on and because one of the reasons I wanted to do this, I, I, I hope everything's okay. But one of the reasons I wanted to do it was your involvement in the other F word. Um, that is something that just, that movie means a ton to me. And it was something that I just wanted to touch on. And it's like, oh, he, he's doing dad shit. Great. Uh, that That's perfect. So yeah, was, that's exactly what I was doing. My daughter got busted. Uh, oh no. Getting on a vape in school and she had never done it before. And she got stoned and <laughs> she, her heart was palpitating and she threw up because Pot, the pot today is so strong and uh just she got suspended and we had to go get her reinstated today and um you know i think it's going to be a good lesson for her um she didn't enjoy it and it kind of kicked her ass a little bit and you know that's it's just what life is life will kick your ass and you it, it doesn't matter how many times it happens it matters how many times you get get back up again and how you get back up. That's been my experience for me. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry I had to cancel on you, but it was just like, oh, shit. No, Gotta... I, I get it. And when I was a kid, when I was in high school and the first times I smoked pot, it was nothing like it is today. It was oh. it, it, night and day. I, I can't even imagine. It's like taking acid the degree of like what pot does to you compared to what it it was like it was like a beer when i when i did it and now it's something it's a lot stronger than anything i ever did well you know i'm sober and clean 34 years but you know back in the day man you get a joint of like some of that mexican weed and and you and your buddies take a few hits you get a nice little buzz right that's it <laughs> you know you're laughing you're just you're you're not paranoid you're not this this new shit is just like you know it's like incredibly strong and people go into psychosis all the time yeah all the time hospitals are talking about it they're like fentanyl and then weed especially in places like california where it's legal um and they're selling that engineered that canadian engineered stuff that's like you know old pot when i was smoking it maybe you were it was like a hundred to 200 mics of THC per per like ounce. And now it's like 5,000 or 10. Oh my times. God. Yeah. No, it's that intense. What's fun about that? That's That does not sound like a good time. What do you want to be? <laughs> I don't understand why you want to be that stone. I don't, I don't, I just, 
I mean, if you want to get that stone, do something that makes you feel good, like <laughs> heroin. That's, you know, the old blues guy said, if if there's something better than heroin, God kept it for himself. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Oh but, uh, you know, you know um, it was, I think it, it's because of all the ramifications and the consequences, it's turned out to be a learning experience. And, you know, she was feeling sorry for herself for a day or two, but we we got her back up and she's uh I think she's she's good she's gonna be good. I think it's gonna be good. I mean and I think it's gonna be one of those things that I'm glad happened now when she's surrounded by people instead of like going into psychosis somewhere when she's like in college in a dorm, you know. Um, oh it it's one of those things that it's just yeah, do it when you're in a protected, safe place. Figure that out because because you, you're absolutely right. It's, I, I mean, I I made plenty of mistakes in my life, and it's the, a lot of those things are defined the character of who I am. And I'm glad I went through all the shit I went through. I wouldn't take back any of it. But when you have kids, you really want to protect them from your mistakes, and, and unfortunately, they have to learn a lot of that crap on their own. They do. So, do you have children? I do. I have two. I have a 13 year old and a seven year old. Okay, so you're right on the brink of going into being a teenager. I, yeah, he's he's full on teenager yeah. right now. So it's uh, it's pretty great. I, I kind of I, there's uh, yeah, there's a lot of elements of it that are hard, but the the well, fact wait that, till he goes to high school. Was he in eighth grade this he's year? He's in eighth grade. Yeah, he'll go next yeah. year. Next year, it's a whole different world, dude. How does it change? Just I mean, he's going from this size pond to this size pond. And, you know, he's not the big fish in the pond anymore. He's the minnow in the pond. And all these kids up here, all the cool kids. I mean, that kind of hierarchy hasn't changed since we were in high school. You remember going to high school and you're like, oh, my God, this is so cool. And you, you'd be freaked out, but you couldn't let your friends know you were freaked out, you know. And uh, I... Uh, she handled ninth grade pretty well, but I hear a lot of kids start experimenting with rebelliousness, with defiance, and all sorts of stuff in tenth grade. That's that's I about when defiant, I got there. I was defiant and rebellious from the time I was six. So <laughs> still am. So I don't. I, I I I'm not. I'm not the gauge to go by. You know, but um. It is. It is what it is, man. I love being a parent, as I'm sure you do. Yeah, very much so. Best thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, got a 31 year old daughter, and she didn't have she didn't have addictive or um, drug or alcohol issues at all. Whereas this one, I always knew that she was going to be a challenge. I yeah. could just tell when she was a baby that, or the three, four years old that she was addictive personality i could tell well yeah. we can we can smell our own when it comes oh, to that stuff you know it's there's certain things i can see in oh, both i know my you sons. I yeah know you. yeah I, I've, I've seen this before yeah i, I know where the, i know how this story ends so i've been down that path and i'm, I'm going to be here to help you through it and i know there's some stuff you got to figure out on your own but i'm i'm hopefully i'll be there in a way that my old man wasn't so that we can uh get exactly. through this together so but exactly um of the live album I, I just i'm really excited that you did this i've been listening to it for a couple of weeks now um and it's phenomenal man this is i'm wondering what made you decide to do the live album just because i mean it's such a long history for me the first one was kiss alive was the first live album i got when i was a kid so and it, it was most the, most people's first live album was it yours also or yeah but and then uh, Gene Simmons talked about his favorite live albums, and he talked about the Who live at Leeds, and I went back. Yes, I, I, much that. later I found it. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, he talked about um, uh, uh, God, what's the name of that band? I'm blanking on that band. Uh, uh, one of the live at the Fillmore bands. Um, Oh, there was a couple of them that did live at the Fillmore. Was it? What's, his, what's the name? That uh, the, I don't need no. Doc. Did the band do it there also? Uh, I can't remember. Not the, the band. Um, like it's Steve Marriott's lead vocalist. Thirty Days in the Holes or hit single. I'm blanking. 
<laughs> but um, that live album is phenomenal. Um, even even the the uh, Almond Brothers. And I'm not an Almond Brothers fan. Um, it's too jammy for me, too hippie for me. But man, live them doing whipping post live is just oh, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Whipping that's a whole nother thing, man. That's and even Space Girl Blues live, but yeah. whipping post live is just killer. Yep. Right. I mean, and you know, growing up, uh, before I got into punk uh and new wave, I got into rush like the summer before. And I still love Rush. I, they're undeniable. I, they're I, Rush. Yeah. I still love Zeppelin. I still love a lot of that stuff. But for the most part, I tend to, well, like when Cheap Trick came out, they were my shit, man. Kind yeah. of punky, kind of new wave, stripped down, not long songs, great melodies, biting lyrical content, uh, and just wicked sounding rock and roll. And uh, early ACDC with Bon Scott. Big oh my god! Um, I love rock and roll, man. I love yeah. Dave Evans. I love that whole scene. Um, I just love rock and roll. I do to this day. I'll always be a rocker. Well, always. I think it's it's a just a live medium. It was live music that when I was a, you know, you talked about that idea of finding, you know, being intimidated when you were in high school and seeing those kids that were older than you and coming across all that stuff. It was finding my own world and, you know, going to punk rock shows when I was in, you know, ninth, 10th, 11th grade and going up to Philadelphia to see shows that was defined who I was in a lot of ways. And I, and I found this whole family outside of myself through that. And, but it was always the live element of it. Um, The albums could be good sometimes with some punk bands. I loved them. Quality recordings weren't always there. Um, I, I don't think people go back and listen to the adolescence because of the quality of the recordings. No, so. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely not. But there's that intensity. I mean, you listen to the soundtrack of the decline of Western civilization. Sure, yeah, and get out of here. That's awesome. It's That's good. Just, just like I was a huge X fan. That was my that was my shit. I wanted to be John Doe, and I wanted to be married to Xene. L- Los Angeles is undeniable for me. I, it's just, and you're the talking first about album. Yeah, I I think the first four albums are pretty all the way there and then not a fan of anything but, after that but four albums though it, that, that that's at that point you get a lifetime pass for me you know it's yeah. i will always be a fan if you if you give me that much it's I just think we got four good live out i think we got four good albums you do you got um, you know I, and actually i think our last record we put out in 2015 uh black is the new black which is a really heavy record um, I think that's one of our best, actually. But well, it's I, I was gonna say you're even something like Sing Away, that's it's one of your better songs, man. That's a great song, and it's kind of buried in the album. So hang out till the end because yeah, I think but, it's it's one of the best songs in on the album, honestly. You know, that's that's a single. Have you seen the video? I have not, no. Watch the video on YouTube, Sing Away okay. and the girl in it, the little girl in it. Uh, that is the girlfriend of the boy of the protagonist. Um, that's my daughter. Oh, that's, yeah, nice that's, man. Yeah, she looks like she's thirteen. She's not. <laughs> she's she just hit sixteen Friday. It was her sweet sixteen. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah, but um, thanks. And you know, that's the that is the first song that's it's getting played on the radio. At, at different places across the country, some rock stations, some alternative stations, some uh, classic rock stations, some a lot of uh, college yeah. or, or community radio. Yeah. And I think we're getting paid on 25 to 30. Right. At one point we were. I don't know what we're still getting played, but I know they're playing us in L.A. at uh, Cal Northridge. They're playing us all the time. So. That's great, cool. man. But 30 years in and it's still resonating with people. And I think that the way you were talking about cheap trick is the way I would talk about your band as well. Oh, okay. You have, you have this really, you have powerful guitars. You have a vulnerable, um, deceptively, um, simple, but powerful lyrics where you're just, you cut straight to the point in a way that there's, it's just really impressive. And, but there's a level of vulnerability in your lyrics that's pretty rare 
um, in popular music. And, and I, I don't know if that goes back to the, uh, punk rock days, that kind of thing of just putting it out there. Um, but that can't be easy to be as open as you are. Well, you know, one, I come from a background of crime and, uh, you know, I grew up in a housing project and, uh, used to think I was a thug back in the day, carried a gun, dealt drugs, did all that stuff. So, um, there was a lot, built up a lot of, you know, armor and a lot yeah. of, um, subterfuge and just, just re people, um, from who I was because I had been raped when I was eight. And I, I was, you know, I have, a, I have a lot of, uh, you know, my dad left when I was six. Um, my brother died when I was 12, a lot of, a lot of PTSD, man. You know, I'm doing a lot of EMDR still. <laughs> you know, I would imagine, man. We're going through that trauma. And, but that being said, just as a kid who grew up with the Beatles and the Stones and, you know, those bands, I love a storyteller. Dylan, yeah. I love a storyteller. And I love songs in the first person. And I love songs that tell stories that are poetic, but they don't dick around, you know? They they tell a story, a linear story, um, but at the same time in a way that's poetic and full of light and and balance. Yeah, and that's what I've I've aspired to. And there's a few songs where I think I've nailed it pretty hard, as far as I'm concerned. There, there's I, a song called "Learning How to Smile." Mm -hmm. It's on our fourth album. I think that's one of my better songs. But then it's there's these different sides of it like something like heroin girl i think also encapsulates that but it has a younger man's voice and as you can hear there's more perspective with years when you go through the songs though and i and i think that's really but it's there the root of it you can hear that um vocal intention i think right away thank you i i, I think you're right and when you hear the live version of it it's like um you know Today's episode of the following films podcast is brought to you by Bookman's. So the last time I went into Bookman's, I went straight over to the movie section as I often do. And I was so excited because one of my favorite things that happens when I go in there, I'm looking for a movie and I don't know exactly what I want to see, something I've been meaning to see and there's a blind spot. And when I saw East of Eden, I was super excited because it's a movie I've been wanting to see for years but for whatever reason, I've just never gotten around to it. So the film adaptation of John Steinbeck's East of Eden, it's a powerful cinematic achievement. I, I know I'm not the first person to say this, but it absolutely does justice to the novels that what can only be described as profound themes and the complex characters. It's directed by uh, Kazan and features outstanding performances uh, from the whole cast, but mainly here by James Dean as uh, Cal Trask. The film captures the essence of the book while adding its own visual and emotional dimension. Uh, the cinematography, which looks absolutely incredible in 4K, captures the rugged beauty of the California landscape. So it sets the stage for this intense family drama that unfolds throughout the film. And the screenplay manages to condense this complex novel that is East of Eden without feeling truncated. It makes this really intricate plot, takes that and then just condenses it down and really only gets the essential elements of it. And all the themes are still intact with love, jealousy, and the struggle between good and evil. That's all there. And it doesn't feel like a lesser than it feels like a compliment to um, if you've read East of Eden and haven't seen the film definitely catch up on it highly recommend it if you've only seen the film and haven't read the book definitely check out the book as well it's worth your time uh, but in the movie James Dean's portrayal of the troubled Cal it's nothing short of iconic uh, it showcases his raw talent and charisma the supporting cast is also incredible especially Julie Harris I think does uh, equally compelling job here um, with just an outstanding performance and 
there's a depth and authenticity to these characters that wasn't very common for this time. So it's something pretty remarkable here. Uh, East of Eden, it's absolutely a classic that continues to resonate uh, to this day, still holds up. Um, I think that's mainly because of its exploration of human nature and the complexity of family dynamics. It's a timeless masterpiece that deserves a place in the annals of cinematic history. I, I think it's there. It just took me a long time to catch up with it. Uh, this is a must watch for anyone who appreciates powerful storytelling and exceptional performances. So remember, next time you go to Bookman's, they have your cool covered. Hope you enjoy the rest of the show. It's an older man singing it, but it's still a younger man's voice. Yeah. yeah you know, um, and uh i like that di- i like that dichotomy well know? it's like, it's let's try like on this old bomber. bomber jacket again see how it fits for a minute and just kind of i wear it all the time dude <laughs> i'm still wearing my black <laughs> jean jacket that i've had for i don't even know how long well i mean i still have. i, wear, my... I still wear levi's <laughs> i mean no. it's it's the uniform it's hard to let go of it's just there's there's well, a a point and i think uh a younger man it's a lot of what you define is by what you consume and i think as you age it's about what you make that matters it's about what you create um it can be the art that you make the work that you do the you know the family that you raise those things it's what you create that matters you know when you're a young punk it's about what you're consuming and what you're destroying and so i think as i've I've gotten older and matured hopefully a little bit and grown it's uh, really about what i'm building now in life oh absolutely um yeah, I, I mean, you know, I'm 61, and I'm still, and I've got MS, and you know, all the the end of my life is not that far away. Hmm. And I don't say that being a fatalist; it's just true. You know, we live about 80 years. Most people, 75 to 80 years, if right? Lucky. So I got about 20 years. Um, I want to spend them not in a wheelchair. You know. Um, with my disease, that's a very, very possible, if not probable future, um, depending on how I eat, taking my medication, my exercising. When I leave here, I'm going to go home and take a swim in my pool. Got to swim every day. It keeps, it keeps the, uh, the MRIs away, you know, (laughs) having to do MRIs. Uh, which is a good thing. You know, getting older just kind of sucks, man. How old are you? What, 40? I'm, I'm, I'm 47. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm closer five. to 60 than I am to 30 at this point. It's, it's, well, you, you get to that age. And no, you're, you're not. Well, but yeah, by two, yeah, I am. By yeah. Two, by two <laughs> I'm 47. <laughs> so I'm, th- I'm 13 years away and I'm 17 years past 30 at this point. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I feel more akin to that side of things and you start looking at, I have more years behind me than in front of me. At this point, there's just, I'm, I'm not going to make it into my nineties. I don't and, see that. Oh, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be like shitting in a bag, living no. on, you know, like being kept alive by wires. And I don't want that. I don't want to be, I don't want to be like that. I'd rather walk out in the desert, throw a bunch of meat on top of me and get eaten by coyotes <laughs> after I shoot up a couple of speed balls, of course. You know, you're gonna go. I mean, yeah, if you're gonna go out, you're gonna right? go, go, right? <laughs> Get some headphones, throw on, um, you know, some velvet underground and, and call it a day, man. Like that, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, dude. See, I, if, I, my, my, I'm death, dirt. my, my death song, on. if I, uh, <laughs> I, I, it was always gonna be sweet nothing if I had a death song that was gonna be okay. it by the velvet underground. So, okay, but I, although I guess, um, those first couple Iggy Pop records wouldn't be bad either, though. The, the the I I think well the first one's got some great songs but the second one is is a great record, uh, Funhouse is a great record. Mm-hmm. The song on it called Dirt it is just that bass line boom down boom 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 boom. I it's just it's awesome. It's there, never covered it. It doesn't need to be covered. It's too good. Leave it alone. It's like Beatles songs. Don't. Don't cover Beatles songs. Leave them alone. You're not going to add anything to it. Not you're adding just... anything. And you're not going to make it sound like you. Leave it alone. You know? <laughs> and I've always, I'm always, I'm, I'm blessed that I've always felt like that, you know? Like some songs, we've done a lot of covers. And I don't think about making it better. I think about 
doing it with my voice and my idea, but while retaining what made the song great and respecting that, you know, the hook, uh, uh, the that kind of thing. Um, we just got done touring with a band whose one hit, one claim to fame, was covering a Don Henley song. And Oh, uh, the Ataris. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's great. You know, it's a great cover. Um, it, and it's very similar to the original, just uh, just enough different that it's an Atari song, though. It's just that little bit different, but it's very similar to the original in a lot of ways. Yeah, 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 it is. I mean, they, they didn't reinvent the wheel. You know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't do that. Um, but, uh, but my point is, they did a great cover, and I think it's respectful, and it sounds like the Atari's. Oh yeah, and but, they they have a lot of other stuff though. They're they're a solid band. They're I think they have uh, quite a few good songs. I've enjoyed them. They're they're a good band. How was that you tour? Like pop, you like the pop punk? Well, um, I I like everything, man. I mean, that was the like when I was. That's what you grew up with. It was part of it. Um, I grew up close to DC area, so it was a lot of like the third wave kind of the Fugazi, the Minor Threat, and all that stuff was already done. But then. You know, by the time I was in high school, yeah, the pop punk stuff started getting popular, but it was it was mostly hardcore. Um, you know, but there was a deep love of that. He's like, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Like he didn't know you were (laughs) you were on. Uh, oh no, he's just used to it at this point. I know. Uh, But like the Descendants, to me, that's that's something one of the first bands I really fell in love with, and that's to me that's probably the first pop punk band. I one of yeah, I would say yeah, definitely they. The um, I heard them on the radio when their album Cheer came out with uh, um, uh, not Cheer, um, what was it? Enjoy, 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 was, enjoy, yes, 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 song with Cheer. And uh, I heard Cheer on the radio, and I'm like, what the hell is that? That's awesome. But they they played so fucking fast, and it was so, so melodic at the tight. same time, yeah, it's so tight. I mean, they still are. They still play, and they're still tight. Yeah, all those South Bay guys. Um, I'm friends with Jimmy from uh, Pennywise, and I've met a lot of those old guys that I kind of grew up with, you know, Milo and all those guys. Um, it's, uh, I, I I love Power Pop. I never really, I don't know if I would put the the Ataris or, or MXPX into that book, personally for me. But uh, there are some great pop punk bands that there, are. Yeah, I, I, what, what would you call that then? I mean, it's I, I don't know. I, I think no, it's no, a, they're pop punk. I just don't okay. think we're at that level. Oh no, 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 not at all. There's a, there's definitely levels to to that thing. And no, I would not put them in even a Pennywise level for me personally. And no. but that's just those were the, I, I don't know, there was something, there was never any cynicism in the those bands, in their music. And I think that, that's what it really is. It was all, they, I never felt like they were following a trend. It was they were following their hearts more than anything. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they were following what they liked. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite bands of that ilk that came out was a band called Chicks Dig It out of Canada. Yeah. 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 Because they were just so much fun. All their songs were about what their their moms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they were great. Or or smoking pot, THC. <laughs> I'm gonna need some TLC. You know, <laughs> I got plans for you tonight. And I'm just <laughs> like, well, I, okay, clever. But with that, um, I think that your your album falls into that, though. It shows how what a fun live band you are and that you oh, can you do it live uh, live at the whiskey or go-go. Yeah. 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 I appreciate that. Yeah. I think, you know, you can definitely hear our, our punk roots coming out there. Oh yeah. You know, old school punk roots. Um, you know, when people go, you don't sound punk, you don't sound like Goldfinger or this and then I go, dude, my, my punk bands that I saw when I was a kid were live X. Um, you know, all the all the all the LA punk rock bands, San Francisco punk, the nuns, the Avengers, you know, 
that's what I saw growing up. Um, one of my favorite bands from that time, uh, uh, Asian Orange. Oh my uh, God. Yeah. Mike yeah. Palm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of the New York stuff, of course. You like know. Gorilla Biscuits and that kind of stuff, or earlier than I don't that? Know. No, it was a little later. Was oh, a little, later. Yeah, that was a little later for me. We're talking late 70s, early 80s. Okay. Pretty much. But X was the king of the hill, as far as I was concerned. When Los Angeles and and uh Wild Gift came out, that was it. That was that was that was it for me. And then hardcore, you know, that came out, circle jerks and uh a black flag and and I liked their music. I liked how noisy and stupid and just, you know, unrelenting in your face like a fist it was. But you go to their shows and it was all full of like suburban dickhead jocks, yeah. you know, slamming into girls. You know, and that's when slam dancing and later becoming moshing came, be, became. Now you go to mosh pits and it's like choreographed and these kids are doing kung fu the, the moves. spin kick moves and stuff. It's <laughs> come up to me, kid. I'll take this chain wallet. The I'll take this wallet chain that I still wear, wrap it around your neck. Let's see. Let's see if you do some pretty moves for me. I, I didn't get into punk rock to learn dance moves. It, it was because I couldn't dance. Was a big part you, of that. You, you get into punk rock to avoid learning dance. Music. Exactly, man. The antithesis of that. <laughs> you know, like like it, I maybe pogoing was about as deep as I would get into learning a dance. So that's that's what we did back in the days was yeah. pogo. You know, um, I uh, when I was sixteen, the guy that lived in the apartment uh, above us. Um, he he dealt pot and I mm-hmm. sell pot for him and stuff like that and do and do like nefarious things. Um, um, but he uh, he asked me if I wanted to go to San Francisco with him and his friends to see um, the Sex Pistols at the Fillmore. Oh wow. Brooklyn. Winterland, Winterland, not, not the film work, Winterland. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't know he was gay. And we went up and stayed in the Castro with, you know, I was a little 16 year old boy with a bunch of gay men. And I'd never been safer in my life. Yeah. They just protected me and took care of me. And it was just a wonderful experience. And I never was freaked out by it, but, but you know, later I told my mom, like, you're decades later. She's like, I knew that guy. I knew that guy was weird. I'm like, <laughs> it was a weird mom. Just, well, it was, uh, you're like, a th- I was a theater kid. So I was, oh, uh, you were a theater, you were, you were a drama club kid. huh? Yeah. Well, I was, a I was an electrician and a carpenter. So, oh. but I, I was, I've always been somebody that was drawn to art and artists. So just the, I just wanted to be around that. And so you, wanted yeah. to be, so you were like crew for them. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. And so that, that was all my, those are my friends that those are the people that I grew up with. And so it, yeah, it was a group of weirdo misfits, but you're right. I never felt safer than when I was with those guys, you know, it was, uh, we were a tribe. We were just the people that didn't quite fit in anywhere else. And it was, you know, you go to a place like Castro or somewhere like that. And it's just, you see that there's, Oh, there's a whole world of us. It's, you know, we are, we, there's a, there is an Island of misfit toys that we can go to. There's these places that we end up carving out for ourselves. And one of the beautiful things, there's so many negative things about the internet. I think that kids now, despite all the negativity they get from it, they can feel less alone, hopefully than they did when I was a kid, I think. Well, that's that's what this is all about, man. Yeah. And I don't know if your 13 year old has a phone yet. He does, but, yeah. Well, it's I know the social media thing. We it's waited rough. until she was 15 before we allowed her to have it. And we monitored it really hard. But then last summer we didn't. And this early this semester of 10th grade, she's gotten kind of out of control with it. So one of the ramifications is that. 
She has no social media until she's out of the doghouse. She has to pay back all those demerits and stuff. And that's going to take a few months, a couple of months. And I'm like, you lived without it before. You can live without it now. Not going to kill you. We didn't have it. We made no. it through okay. We figured things out. So oh, I got in a lot of trouble. I didn't need that shit. And yeah, you could get <laughs> you could you could do some serious damage without a cell phone, that's for sure. But um, you know, I mean, it's all about perspective and just being one as a parent, um, being reflective um instead of being reactive. Yeah. You know? Listen. Sorry, I didn't understand um, that. Sorry. <laughs> she she's a very bossy lady. This lady. Yeah, she she kind of runs all of our this lives. This lady right here. <laughs> and that lady right in that. Yeah. She's everywhere. And then when she's not there, there's Alexa, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. She's everywhere. They're everywhere. Um and for a guy who's been married four times, it's pretty normal <laughs> for me to be told what to do by a woman. I, I I find my life is better. I, left yeah. to my own devices, I'm, I'm not great on my own. So yeah. I, I I'm okay with being and they're in directions. And it's, they're nice to you, you know. I mean, <laughs> sex with you, it's wonderful. It's great. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, yeah. Two jokes. It's, it's awesome. I love yeah. it. They they see something in us somehow. I don't know what it is, but yeah, I. I'm a very, very lucky man. I'm well, 14 speak for years yourself. Old. I make a lot of money. I know what you <laughs> mean. <laughs> well, I don't have that's that going not, for I had to go, true. I had to go on charm alone. And I'm not exactly the most charming individual. So well, I when I was drinking, man, if you know, when I get up to two to three drinks, I was super charming, super charming. Could sell anything to anybody. Charm the pants off just about any woman that I wanted to. Never tried with men, but yeah, who knows? Yeah. Um, but uh, the point problem is, you keep drinking. You feel like you've stayed the same, but everybody else that sees you, you're like, "Hey, how you doing?" <laughs> but to you, it's like, "Hey, baby, how you doing?" To them, it's like, <laughs> you, know? you know. Have you? Uh... That's hot. Jim gibberish is, you know, that's an aphrodisiac, right? Gibberish. Have you seen a uh, seen the movie? What is it? A uh, forty year old virgin. It's directed by Judd Apatow and has Leslie Mann in it. Leslie Mann is Judd Apatow's wife. I, I love Leslie Mann. Okay, so the scene where she's drunk in that movie. Okay, the part where she's drunk in that apparently that's based on reality because she thought she well, was that's his I, wife. Yeah, yeah, that's his wife. And she thought she was like this charming drunk that was very funny and just, you know, gregarious when she went out. She was great to be around. She was the life of the party. And he was like, oh, no, no, no. I want you to go out with Seth tonight. I want you guys to drink and I want Seth to record it. And that's what we're going to base a performance on. And then she finally saw what she was actually like when she drinks that night. And so, yeah, that, it's that exact thing that you're talking about, the reality of it and what our perception of it is. Those are wildly different things. I love that movie, and I love uh, I love uh, Knocked Up, where so you know, those characters came from originally. Yeah. You know? Yep. But, but uh, man, you know we've been through that with, with uh, stop eating cupcakes, <laughs> and he's like he's like I'm, I'm oh that's gonna, this is forty yes just, huh. That's this is 40. Oh, you're talking about 40 year old virgin. No, no, no. This is 40 is the one that I was talking. Yes. Yeah. I did, uh, the three you're talking of those about titles. This is 40. This is 40. Uh, no, that's me and my wife, one of our favorite movies. The with Paul Rudd and the cupcakes. Love it. Yes. Amazing. With the cupcakes, putting it in the trash and taking a <laughs> trash, taking another bite. Um, as a person with addictive behavior, yes, I can, I can. And, and uh, him doing the baseball thing on the sly, she thinks he's having an affair. That 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 that's totally like. Sometimes my wife, I'm I'm like I'm gonna go to a meeting at the studio and have a meeting, and she'll be like, she'll come in all dressed up, and she'll be like, and I'm sitting there with a bunch of sober guys. Hey, baby, what's up? Is everything okay? Like, yeah. I'm okay. And then the lady she'll tell me, I didn't think you were there. I just got crazy and thought you were somewhere else <laughs> or 
or that you had a woman in the studio. I go, you really think I would bring a woman into a guitar room with no bed? Really? You don't think I'm going to go get a fucking hotel room? Like, I wouldn't give you the exact address of where I was going, probably. Look, I was unfaithful with every person and woman in my life until I met her. And lo and behold, I don't know, go figure. We've been married, been together for almost 20 years. Oh, congratulations, man. Yeah. And thank you. And um, it's not a coincidence. You know, it's not an accident. When you're with the right one, it's not that hard. Well, and you got to be in the right place to be with the right one. I wasn't there. I hadn't done the work. And I was when I met her, I was willing to do the work. And uh, I left a lot of blood in the water and uh, a lot of amends that I've made and still still need to. And we'll we'll do in due time, you know, if they'll let me. If not, that's cool, too. But well, I you know, I write them out. That's what we do in the program. Well, um, all we can do is try to be better than we were the day before. It's just try to be a little bit better, a little bit more centered, a little bit more grounded, a little bit more humble every day that we go forward. Absolutely. Well said. And it's easier to do when you can remember what you did the day before, <laughs> which I can now. That, that's very true. As I get older, I'm starting to forget saying so. Who knows? Anyway. <laughs> Start going to the other side. Well, I know we're way over, man, but yeah, I, I got to get going. I know. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this day. Art. It was really nice to meet you and uh, nice. congratulations on the live record. That's a, uh, I had a blast with it. It's been great listening to it and just uh, having the interview postponed just meant I got to listen to it for a couple more days. And this is definitely cool. one that's going to keep showing up. So, and the double uh, Coke bottle green. I know it's so good. It's, so, right? it's fucking dope. 180 it looks gram. Great. Yeah. Have you put it's it great. on? You listen to the vinyl? I have. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm fucking awesome. It does. That thick, heavy vinyl. And Coke bottle green is the original vinyl. Yep. For the black in it, you know? And it, it's pure, though. It's There's no impu- impurities in it. That's why they started putting black in it so you wouldn't see the impurities. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. I'm a, I I'm, like it. I, yeah, I'm I'm a sucker for um, well presented vinyl, and this is definitely one that I think people would enjoy, and they should definitely pick it up. So, congratulations, man! Thanks, brother. Thanks for your right, time. Take care. Nice to meet you, man. Yeah. Bye. Time enough to figure you out. Time enough to write this down. Wish me luck. Give me hope.
always crack.